I'm George Galloway, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. Kali Mahorra means free word, and that's what I speak. I'm George Galloway, Kali Mahorra. Free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, coming to you from London. Kali Mahorra means free word, and every word here spoken tonight will be free, unless anyone was paid to say it, and what would I know about that? Russia is the word on everybody's lips. It's the word on the lips of every Arab following Russia's decisive intervention in the invasion and attempted overthrow of the regime in Syria. It's the word on the lips of every American because a very serious effort is being made to literally overthrow and regime change the government of the United States, all on the basis of supposed Russian links and Russian interference. It's the word on everybody's lips, even in Britain. At the time of recording, the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, is today accused across sundry front pages in Britain's billionaire-owned newspapers as literally being a paid KGB agent from the Cold War days of the 1980s. I don't know how that's going to work out by the time you see this programme but it could scarcely be a more grave attack. And it's the word on everyone's lips because very soon there will be another Russian presidential election. Vladimir Putin, to the absolute consternation of the Western media and their political class, I used to say that the other way around, but it's quite clear to me now that the political class belong to the media rather than the other way around. To their absolute consternation, President Putin may even win the presidency on the first ballot, which is a tall order, but may well be achieved. The rise and rise of Vladimir Putin is something which my audience this evening of distinguished experts on both sides of this argument and enthusiastic amateurs like me are not only knowledgeable of, but deeply interested in, as should you all be, because Russia is back. It's back in the Middle East. It's back as a player in world affairs. It's back, and that's the problem for Western governments. That's the problem for the media. When Russia was flat out on the floor in a drunken stupor under its previous management of Boris Yeltsin, with everyone picking its pockets, Russia stood the chance of being really, really popular in the world, at least until its money ran out. But Vladimir Putin's era has restored national dignity to the Russian people and definitely extended Russian influence in the world. And a lot of people obviously don't like that. Now, I've got this terrific audience, so less from me than usual because we want to hear from them. We've got a front bench, but the back benchers are just as talented. Let me give the uh, microphone first to a man who has the only job title in the whole world other than striker at Manchester United Football Club that I would like to have had. He's a former Kremlin advisor in former days, and he's now a very distinguished commentator and analyst, not just on Russia, but on world affairs. Alexander Nekrasov, welcome back to Kali Mahorra. Thank you, George. Where do you, as I, as I described the new Russia and its place in the world, did you find anything to disagree with? Well, first of all, I think it's a very complicated world where we found ourselves in. I think that um, the previous world where we had the Cold War, it was um, pretty clear where everybody was standing. It was pretty predictable what's going to happen. 
And uh, I think there was less worry and anxiety across the world. I think the current situation where we sort of are saying that there is no Cold War anymore, I think there is. I think the new Cold War is much more dangerous than the old Cold War, simply because for the first time in the history of relations between the West and Russia, Western propaganda is targeting not just the regime, as it happened in the Soviet uh, years, but the people themselves, the Russian people. And I said that on Russian television, that you need to understand that the target now are you. Not just Putin, not just his ministers, are you. I think the film, The Death of Stalin, which I saw and I found despicable, disgusting. I think that just proves that now they are ridiculing the people. They are going after the people. And uh, this is dangerous. And this unpredictability we find everywhere, including uh, the, the, the thing you mentioned that there is a sort of a power struggle in Washington, which is, by the way, very dangerous. This power struggle can result in anything. Because it's one thing we have a power struggle in some tiny country, or even in Britain, I dare say. This is not dangerous. But when America is unstable, when in America we see Congress fighting against the president, we see intelligence services coming up with stuff, which is absolutely unbelievable. We just had Robert Mueller coming out with a list of Russian companies and individuals who supposedly tried to influence the United uh, States election. The list is absolutely preposterous because it's made up. I mean, the, the, the main mastermind behind this is supposedly Putin's chef in the Kremlin. T two of the three companies that are listed as financing... I hope Jeremy Corbyn never ate at that. <laughs> <laughs> two, two of the three companies that supposedly must you were know, behind this campaign are actually catering companies. So, uh, you know, uh, that's a bit weird. And um, so what I'm saying is that the corruption in Washington has reached levels when intelligence services are playing games that we have never seen before. So this is a dangerous situation. And in this dangerous situation, the elections in Russia are under strain already because the strain comes from all over the place. We have a situation now when Ukraine was taken over by the West. I do accept that Russia is to blame also, because Russia missed it. I was actually calling Moscow uh, in uh, November when the, the, the protest started, and I was saying, guys, you're going to lose Ukraine. What is happening there? This is a coup. This is not a protest. These are combatants. They're going to take power. Well, the Sochi Olympics, they were too preoccupied. So, but, but we can't say that it's only Russia's fault. The West basically organized that coup. Uh, they took out a regime which was acknowledged by the EU, by the United Nations, and so on. So what I'm saying is this is not a normal election. Russia is under pressure. Russia is surrounded by NATO troops which is unheard of. They're on, the, on its borders. No longer is Russia protected by this buffer zone of European countries. They are there on the border. They're armed, they're dangerous, they can move in any time. Inside the country, NGOs are still operating as agents of influence, foreign influence. Even the Russian television, which I find remarkable, is working against Russia, at least part, some parts of it. And, um, I think that in this situation, we, we can always say, and I hear people telling me, well, it's an undemocratic election, you know, because Putin is so strong that he has no opponents. But I tell them, I explain to them that Russia is now in a very dangerous spiral of its history. And I don't think it's the time to sort of... Um, create a situation when pretty dangerous people might end up in power. So I know there are restrictions. We can't hide the fact there are restrictions, but there are restrictions in every country. 
I mean, nobody can say that Americans elect, American elections are free and fair. I mean, come on. Nobody can say, for example, that in France, Macron, who came out of nowhere, nowhere, he had no party, nobody knew him, suddenly he's elected in a landslide. So let's be practical and say there are problems with elections everywhere in the world. In Russia, the situation is aggravated by the fact, as I said, that Russia is under great strain. And Russia is in a situation where things may, may, come, they may go dangerously wrong. So the one thing that Putin has managed to do in the 18 years in power, he has managed to keep Russia together. We don't see two Russias or three or five. And that is his greatest achievement, which up to date few people realize. So when people say to me, well, how come so many Russians support him? The Russians support him, first of all, because of what I've just said, that Russia is still united. It's still together, a one country. So that probably overrides a lot of other things and problems as well. We must Let's leave that there, and we'll come back to you. Charlie Wolf uh, is a distinguished American commentator, a Donald Trump supporter, uh, a Republican, a broad uh, broadcaster, journalist, man of parts. Um, this must be difficult for you, Charles, because you would instinctively not like Russia very much historically, uh, and yet your president, your party, are effectively accused of being Russian agents. How do you square that? Well, I, I, it's not. They're not. I mean, uh, there's been no uh, collusion proven. There hasn't been a shred of evidence. Now, do, does Russia... Uh, meddle in American elections, yes, <laughs> and, you know, it's no big surprise, they always have. Uh, and they're not trying to get necessarily Trump in or Hillary in, uh, but in, in a sense what Alexander was just doing, now I don't want to call you a, you know, a propagandist or anything, but, uh, you know, this disbelief in... No, no, actually I'm not, I'm not. Uh, it's a disbelief in the system. You know, the Russians would rather see the whole system come down, the democratic system. They want people to say, yes, Donald Trump is not the president because, yeah, he got in through collusion, or Hillary is not the president because of this. They want to sow seeds of dissent. And, and, and unfortunately, the, the American system seems to be helping the Russians at present on, on to an extent, both sides, um, you know, especially the, uh, the Democrats. You know, again, like I said, there's been no signs of collusion whatsoever. Meddling? Yes. Um, and, and I was just thinking, you know, saying that this isn't necessarily going on now, uh, but they said that in a sense about the 60s when we knew it was, and uh, uh, you know, and it was kind of creative where you had people running catering firms. Uh, you know, if, if, if it wasn't like that, I don't think we'd had all these James Bond movies. Uh, so they, they, I don't know why he's laughing about catering. Uh, the in the Americans on ITV, the whole thing is being run uh, behind the mask of a travel agent. Yeah, I mean, uh, even smaller than a catering uh, company. The Americans is a wonderful series about implanted, deeply rooted. Hmm. Uh, KGB agents pretending to be Americans, uh, an American travel agent. Oh, you know, I, I grew up with uh, with the TV show Get Smart. Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember with Don Adams, and uh, you know, it was a comedy, but it was a wonderful takeoff on the whole spy versus spy uh, uh, routine. So we we know it happens. Um, I, I don't know how effective Mueller is going to be uh, with this uh, this current probe of his. I know we had. These... Are you worried that Trump will be overthrown over this? Well, we, we don't necessarily have overthrows in, in, in our system, but uh, they're, they're trying to well, impeach. Well, a rose by any yeah. other name, yeah. Charles. I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, trying to impeach the president would be a mistake. Uh, I think the Democrats, well, we'll see what happens in the, uh, in the midterm elections coming up in, in November when we have ours. Um, I, I think if the Democrats are smart, they would sort of start to work with the man instead of this uh, program of resistance, uh, which is not gaining them any votes or any friends. Uh, just as an aside, you look back to the State of the Union, where we're even... Trump was talking about things Democrats uh, uh, are in favor of, and they're all sitting on their hands. That didn't go over too well. Um, but um, I think it's important that we are addressing this. We know that the, the threat of meddling is real, uh, as it was back in the 60s. I know people make fun of uh, McCarthy, and yes, he was a drunk, and a lot of people were uh, you know, being accused when they weren't, uh, you know, weren't uh, supposed to be accused, you know, they were innocent, but that, you know, it was going on. You know, people forget there were reds in the beds, as the expression went. 
So the US has interfered in other people's elections from time to time, though, hasn't it? Yeah, but I think the difference would be that, uh, and listen, no, no system is perfect, and we don't have necessarily control over our uh, State Department and our CIA and Foreign Services either. Uh, you know, is, is I think Donald Trump is finding out now. Um, but um, well, there, I would, I would of, hope, I would hope that instead the of blocking uh, uh, um, white supremacist child murderers, uh, they're chasing after Donald Trump's emails. That's what the FBI is doing. Yeah, I know, and and so they're, uh, you know, they're going to get smacked on this one uh, for missing out on this uh, thing with. Uh, uh, this guy uh, that uh, shot up Florida. in Florida, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, here it was. They got a, a tip on this, yeah. and they missed it. Well, look, we'll come back to you, Charles. Peter Jukes sitting next to you is another distinguished commentator, uh, and uh, a man with a very different view of uh, Putin's Russia to Alexander Nekrasov's. Please, kindly give it to us. I don't have a different view of Russia, and I must distinguish Russia from when we talk about the KGB from the former Soviet Union. Mm. I think I have a very different view of Putin, and by the way, with no bias, I stumbled across this. Around about 2014, I went to um, Kiev after the Maidan. One of the first people shot dead by Yanukovych's snipers was just somebody of a Jewish origin, uh, the guy, Afghan refugee, who created the Facebook page which urged students to come down to the Maidan and then they were beaten up and their parents come down. Whatever, I'm sure, there's always people uh, trying to influence elections. The CIA has a terrible history. We've got to Mossadegh and, you know, uh, uh, and to, to Chile and Allende. But what I've discovered since, George, which would really shock us all, and should, people should take back and step back from, whatever we think about America versus Russia, is it's racism, which is at the heart of this. So I followed these Russian controlled bots. They have been proved to be Russian controlled. They pump out the worst kind of, especially Islamophobic racism you can imagine. They, they pump up Tommy Robinson. And I have personal anecdote of that. I didn't quite believe it at the time. We should uh, explain for the international yes, so, audience. Tommy Robinson is a, a kind of street thug for a far-right British outfit called the English Defence League. Indeed, and it's a, a nationalist racist party. You notice that, you know, Britain first got retweeted by Donald Trump. Now, there is a connection between Charlottesville and Nazis celebrating Trump and what's happening in Russia. And there's one key figure you could follow to this to find the ideology, which is Alexander Dugin. What, how Putin got to power with the Chechen, Second Chechen War, so suspicious bomb attacks on apartment, was provoking this civilizational conflict with the South, mainly, with Islam. And Donald Trump and Steve Bannon have picked up on exactly the same ideology of the wall, Islamophobia. And whether or not they're technically colluding on uh, any sort of issues with internet trolls or FBI proof. In a way, that's secondary. They're ideologically uh, uh, colluding. Republicans prefer Putin to Obama. I think his whiteness is a key part of that. And so the other element is, and I have to say this to the people who, who dislike inequality in the world, what happened to Russians' fortunes? when, thanks to Britain and America, we kind of pri helped badly privatize their economy. The richest man in the world is estimated to be Vladimir Putin, whose cello-playing friend has three billion, according to the Pan Panama Papers. If you care for the Russian people, you don't want their money exfiltrated to shadow banking system where it mixes with American hedge fund billionaires. And I think there's an alliance out of ideological interest around some white supremacism and a financial alliance of the shadow banking system. Between the American Republicans exactly. and the Russian... Robert Mercer has his same money in the same places in mm. British Virgin Islands, now St. Nevis and St. Kitts. It's all rolling around the shadow banking system, which is like a third of the whole economy now. And it's unaccountable. And it's mm. a kind of kleptocracy, which I think the whole world is getting involved in. Well, look, I mean, Peter, uh, I'm grateful for that uh, contribution, though, of course, uh, I don't agree with it. But the, uh, the point I made earlier in my introduction, the greatest part of Russia's wealth that was stolen was stolen before Putin. It oh. was stolen in the drunken Yeltsin era. And we loved that. We used to 
applaud I think him it was terrible. and I mean, chuckle, uh, chuckle along with him. No, no, I think that was awful what happened in the 90s. But what happened, Putin, it's very clear. Some of that wealth is playing on English football grounds this very day. But what did Putin... Exactly. Exactly. So what happened was this massive privatization taken over by oligarchs because he had a ridiculous system of privatization with these vouchers. People didn't know what they were worth. A flower seller, a certain Abramovich, gathered up a lot of these and suddenly people owned these huge companies. And it was a sort of regional bar It happened in Ukraine, by the way, before Yanukovych took over. There were regional baron baroneers and local. What Putin did was get them all in line. And interestingly, we talk about free speech. Has anybody seen the Alexander Navalny video, for, which has now been taken down, Russians can't see it, where by tracking an escort girl who attacked his offices, I'm not saying I'm Navalny supporter, but this is a great bit of journalism, they found that she was on the boat, boat with Deripaska, and she put a video, the big oligarch, who now is one of Putin's favoured barons, if you like, and with the deputy prime minister. Quite friendly with Baron Peter Mandelson. <laughs> no, exactly. Look, and they're all over London, and we can talk, a lot of London wealth is we based... Will, we will, but we mustn't be too uh, Anglo-centric. We uh, we'll come back uh, to you, Peter, and the other experts, and hopefully have time for the enthusiastic amateurs too. This is Kali Mahorra, with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London. You're watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but talking about Russia, Russia, the word on everybody's lips. We took the camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Take a look at this. Do you think that Russia or the US are trying to start a new Cold War? A Cold War, no, but it wants, it seems, by its current actions, want to get more of a regional dominance and be able to control a lot of its own borders. If, it, if they're planning for a Cold War, then it's really affecting all of us rather than just America. Because then America will be struggling for their funds that in, indirectly come towards UK as well. Do you think that Russia or the US are trying to start a new Cold War? We see something in news and the media, but we don't know exactly what's happening at the table. So I don't think so. I don't see, I don't know, honestly at the moment. Um, I don't think they have the strength. I don't think they've got another, enough global influence to do that. I think the Chinese would be uh, re up against that as well. I don't see the support for it, personally. I, I just, but honestly, I don't know. Do you think that Vladimir Putin has been a force for good or for bad? Uh, it depends, it depends on, it, he, he's obviously been a good, he's been a, a good person for Trump, but not a good aspect when it comes to people who elected them. I think it's variable. I think his influence has been strange. You know, I, I was quite pro Putin initially, but I've been less so lately with, with, with more of the isolation stuff that, that Russia's been doing as well, and their more aggressive stance as well. So, so I'm not so certain about Putin now, really. I guess that depends if you're Russian or not, doesn't it? I can say he may have a good influence on his own people, but maybe in Europe, people don't like him. Well, uh, some mixed views there about uh, President Putin, who's facing re-election, uh, an election that he is comfortably expected to win. Uh, but that will not be the end of the story. The intrigue and counter-intrigue continues. Dr. Tom, uh, what's your take on what these British people were saying and on this issue generally? Hi, um Thomas Fierschonik, I'm a junior doctor. I think um, a lot of people are quite confused about what's going on. They, they, take their, um, they take their views, their opinions from the media. They're informed by the media, which is in the West predominantly, well, virtually almost all anti-Russian. Um, I would agree with, with what Mr. Nekrasov said earlier about the attacks have moved from being against Putin to being against Russia as a whole. Because the West, the Western politicians, cannot understand why Putin's so popular. He has approval ratings that they could only dream of. They therefore assume it must be something wrong with the Russian people. They assume the Russian people must be either stupid or uninformed or under a dictatorship or living in a sort of North, kind of North Korean um, setting. What they don't understand is that Putin, in his 18 years um, 
at leadership of Russia, three years as president, one year as prime minister, sorry, the three terms as president, the one term as prime minister. He has given the Russian people back dignity. Russia was on its knees. It was actually at risk of being cut up into various uh, smaller countries. It was, pli it was pliant, it was weak, it was um, uh, on its back. It was just the way the West wanted it. Putin gave Russians back dignity. Um, it's very hard to understand people from the West, people who don't understand when your, your country's on its knees and it's about to be go, go the way of a failed state, and suddenly someone comes along and you, within less than two decades, manages to put you back on your feet. Incomes uh, per head, per GDP, have increased by, have tripled under, in the last 18 years. Wages have gone up several times. Unemployment's fallen. Pensions have increased. The war in Chechnya has uh, finished. There's a lot Putin's done, not just for Russia, but also abroad. And actually, he's recognized abroad. Um, Al-Maliki, the uh, Iraqi prime minister, has asked um, for, actually asked Putin if he can have a Russian base in Iraq to help things, um, help stabilize things. In Syria, for example, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of, um, of countries intervening in other countries, but credit where credit is due. Um, Syria was on its, on its knees. It was about to be, go the way of Libya, Afghanistan. ISIS have been, they're not, they're not just defeated, but they're, they're, they're very weak now. They're almost all gone. Syria is a country. It's probably going to be remain stable. Or it's going to ultimately remain in one piece, which is not the way the West wanted things to go. Um, so I think the West leaders are very unhappy about that. They don't want uh, they want to America to maintain its hegemony. They don't want Russia to be part of a multipolar world. Quite so, uh, Daria. Uh, you know a thing or two about these upcoming uh, elections. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell us uh, how you think they are going and why. My name is Daria. Um, I'm originally from Russia and have been living here in the UK for a while now. I'm broadcaster and journalist. Well, it's been very interesting to listen to honourable gentlemen. Um, and I just wanted to touch on uh, um, actual elections. I think these elections will be one of the most interesting elections in Russian history, just because, um, as we know, not only Vladimir Putin is standing, we have two new candidates, one on the right, her name is Ksenia Sapchak. She is a daughter of uh, Putin's mentor. And another candidate, Pavel Grudinin, who is standing as uh, a candidate from a communist party. And as you rightly said, Putin most likely will comfortably win this election. However, I strongly believe on 18th of March, Putin himself will vote for Ksenia Sapchak. And I will explain you why. Just because Ksenia gave him a promise he would not be able to resist. Bear in mind, Putin was in power for 18 years. I totally agree with Alexander and uh, uh, with you as well that country, Putin, Putin's contribution to the country is enormous. But running a country like Russia for 18 years is very tiring. And I think the gentlemen simply deserve retirement. And Ksenia Sobchak during her campaign promised him safe retirement in Sochi, where he can enjoy long walks with his lovely dogs and by seaside and some mountain skiing. And even though Putin will win this election, I'm very confident he will vote for Ksenia because who can resist this offer? And uh, I think it's very important to understand who will win, uh, who will win this election, and who will lose during this election. Even though Putin will stay in power, I think unfortunately he will keep losing his public support, just because people, even though Russians really respect him. This is a democratic country, and those who are in power should be changed eventually. Well, this is one of the problems that strong leaders always have, isn't it? Uh, how are they going to manage the succession? Uh, how are they going to protect their legacy, uh, not be prosecuted uh, in the criminalization game, uh, but nonetheless hand the show over to someone who can take it forward, not uh, back? I'm presuming that the current Prime Minister Medvedev, who was for one term the President also, I'm assuming that uh, his career will end at the same time as Putin's career will end. And you've just given us a name, someone you say is from the right, Sobchak. What's her first name? Senior. Okay, we'll all have to make a note uh, of that name. I myself will be voting as a well-known Russian uh, citizen myself and KGB agent, I'll be voting for the communist candidate as I would have done the last time. I would not vote for, uh, for Vladimir Putin uh, because although I like his foreign policy, I'm not so keen on his domestic policy. And there are far too many rich oligarchs still running around in Russia 
for, for me to vote for him. So, uh, President Putin, that's one vote in the box against your opponent to the left, but you've heard it here. A successor has been named uh, by Daria. Uh, Dr. Marcus, tell us uh, how you see things, please. Yes, thank you. My name is Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, and my doctorate is in Russian history. Uh, Alexander, I agree with everything you said. I would just add that Russia is vulnerable because um, this is the smallest Russia that the world has seen for 300 years. So Russia is very vulnerable. You um, mean in te territorially? Sorry, territorially. Yes. Territorially, yeah. This was his point about yes. the NATO yeah. being literally Absolutely. on the borders for the Absolutely. first time. Um, Daria, your point about Putin voting for Sobchak is peculiar. You can't be serious about that. Um, Childs, America is the biggest violator of international law in the world. It is the biggest violator of the mechanisms of the United Nations in the world. That is indisputable. And Peter, you made a reference to Chechnya. Chechnya is an integral part of the Russian Federation. It was absolutely necessary for Vladimir Putin in the summer, late summer of 1999, to send the Russian military back into Chechnya because it is an integral part of Russia, but also as well, the people that the Russian army were fighting against in Chechnya are the same people that the Syrian army is fighting against today. Islamist Wahhabists. How many Saudis were operating in Chechnya from 1996 to 1999? So it was absolutely acceptable uh, for Russia to go back into Chechnya and to bring it back under the fold of Moscow. Now, turning to the Russian presidential um, elections, they are of no business to any country or any other government in the world. It is an internal matter of the Russian uh, Federation. And another point to make as well is that Russia is not the West and there is no reason it should be. Things happen in Russia which might not be to the taste of many people in Britain um, or in America, but quite frankly, that's absolutely irrelevant. And I would quote Peter the Great, who once said that Russia is a country where things that just don't happen, happen. Now, in regard to what's going to happen this March at the Russian presidential elections, Putin will be re-elected, um, and very, very convincingly. And I would cite two reasons for that. Um, number one, he represents security and stability for the average Russian. And security and stability are the, most, are the two most important things for the ordinary Russian, providing they have jobs, uh, salaries, um, pensions, um, free health care, then they will never leave their houses to protest. And Putin has brought back security and stability uh, for Russia. The second reason why he's popular is because he's a very, very strong leader. And yes, he is authoritarian, but remember what I said earlier, that there might be some things in Russia which aren't to the taste of British people or American people, but the word authoritarian is not a dirty word for the average Russian. It's not a bad word for the average Russian. Um, Russia has to be run in an authoritarian way. Look what happened from 1985 to 2000. You had two unbelievably weak, indecisive leaders running Russia, Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin, and look what happened. The country nearly disintegrated as the Soviet Union did. So it is absolutely necessary for Russia to be run with an iron fist, and that is what Russians want. So yes, he will be um, re-elected. He'll be re-elected because he's authoritarian, that's what Russians want, and because he gives security and stability to the average Russian. There's another point as well, is that since the mid-1990s, there has been an unofficial alliance or an unofficial agreement between the Kremlin and the Communist Party. Now, if you have a look at the 1996 presidential election, it was actually the Communists who won that. It was actually Zuganov who beat Yeltsin. No way did Yeltsin actually win that election. But because of but that... But the Americans interfered in that one. Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, Clinton openly uh, voiced his support for Clinton. Uh, for Yeltsin, and the Americans sent some of their biggest PR strategists to help. But the point is that there is an unofficial agreement between the Kremlin and the Communist Party, and that is another reason why uh, Putin will win. And in regard to the Communist candidate, Pavel Grudinin, I think he's a very, very credible candidate, and perhaps one day 
he might have an opportunity. Well, it's all good news so far. Uh, sir? Zaid Delisa, writer and political analyst. Well, uh, I have to say that the main reason that we can see that there is widespread support for Pu Putin is basically because he restored uh, Russia's authority. He, re he reasserted its power and he has reclaimed its credibility over the international, around the international community. And he has regained the popularity of Russia in, uh, in uh, within Russia and also within the international uh, community. Now, the point is, I mean, they talk about meddling and interfering in elections and in other countries. We've seen America since the 50s, going back to the Iranian government, which was elected. They overthrew that government, installing dictatorship. We've seen them interfere, interfering and meddling in a blatant way, even in countries that are basically considered staunch and close allies. We've seen Stephen Bannon expose in his book that Trump has basically interfered in Saudi Arabia, which is the bastion and the main exporter of tyranny, tyranny and dictatorship, actually altering and interfering in the line of succession. That is by deposing uh, supposedly American ally, that is Mohammed bin Naif, who, who was the crown prince, and replacing him by the youngster, inexperienced, reckless, irresponsible youngster who is actually doing America's bidding and actually implementing, not only implementing America's strategy in the Middle East, but actually financing it and paying 460 billion dollars, the ultimate in what Trump calls the ultimate deal in return for basically changing the line of succession. But let's not forget the highly decisive, emphatic and really instrumental role played by Russia in stabilizing the Middle East. That is in intervening at the right time in Syria and turning the tide, turning the tables on the terrorists, the supposedly called good terrorists. And when Russia was accused by the West uh, that they were actually turning against the good and decent terrorists, we've seen Russia taking them apart, routing their strong bases, both ISIL and Nusra Front, which are both Al-Qaeda, Wahhabi Salafi, financed by the Americans, by the CIA, financed also by the Saudis in cooperation with the Americans and turning Al-Qaeda previously in, the, in what is called ISIL, that is, uh, that is basically a regional military arm for the Saudis to destabilize the entire region. We've seen, and I have to emphasize this point, before Russia's intervention, Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the American staff, says it was okay for Ramadi to be occupied by ISIL, to be overtaken by ISIL. The Americans vetoed the popular mobilization forces, stopping Ramadi from falling in 2015. It was only after the Russian intervention that Dunford, the new chairman of staff, going to Iraq and actually pressing and putting pressure on Ibadi to actually stop uh, uh, and not invite the Russians into Iraq under by promising that the Americans will ratchet up their campaign against ISIS. So they were compelled and forced to ratchet up their feckless performance and feeble campaign uh, against ISIL because of the Russian indecisive... It's all kicking off now on Kalimahorra on Al Maidin television. <laughs> You're watching Kalimahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin television talking about Russia. We took the camera out onto the streets of London to hear what the people thought. Take a look at this. Did you know that Russia's having elections this year? Uh, it does actually, it will not make any difference. They don't have a real democracy, I believe. An election is only really an election if it's completely fair and transparent, which does seem to be lacking in the Russian system. Are you aware that Russia's having elections this year? No, I was not. No, I was not. 
it's kind of a monarchy because Vladimir Putin has been their special agent for uh, 25 years, who contributed in their uh, missions abroad and everything. So he has a lot of power and a lot of support from other uh, members of the parliament. Western media's coverage of Russia has been fair. Um, it depends. See, I feel like that uh, sometimes Western media does not know how to influence the uh, the people. They don't know how much impact they can create with media. I would say yes. Is it fair? Probably. There's definitely some bias, but it's not. It's not always inaccurate or totally unfair, and some. Some outlooks are definitely better than others for news. You know, I don't know about the Western media. It's so strange. The Western media, things like Palestine as well. I don't understand. You really need to look beyond what you see and what's what's fed to you if you want to have a good understanding about world politics. I feel. So, so I don't think Western media is necessarily um, as clean as we'd like to think. Do you talk about the bad and good? Uh, overall, yeah, I think they 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 uh, they talk about uh, Russia fairly. Well, I don't know who the gentleman with the top hat and all those medals are. He must have been a brave soldier, but he had one or two uh, good points to make. Let's continue with the debate. Yes, gentleman in the middle. Uh, yes, well, um, as much as I introduce dis- yourself. Oh, yes, first. my name is Joshua Megan, and uh, I'm here to offer, well, basically agree with most of what was uh, said before, and add develop that a bit. Um, basically, as much as I dis. Disagree with uh, the way the Russian government has handled the election, trying to disqualify Navalny. He is not. I would absolutely categorically not want him as president. Not that it's likely to happen. Now he's the man who yeah. uh, fell at the first hurdle uh, mm-hmm. because of the constitutional uh, disbarment of people with criminal records. Yeah. Am I right? Yes. 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 Go ahead. And because he is. Uh, Apart from well, apart from being uh, you know probably a sycophant to the EU because he wants to give Crimea back, even though Crimea democratically wanted to secede from the Ukraine by a 58% majority, uh, he is he wa- he wants to hand it back to them, which suggests that he wants to uh, completely just basically get, uh, sell Russia out to the EU, in my opinion, and that is dangerous in itself because eastward expansion of the EU has proven very dangerous indeed. As we see in the Donetsk region of eastern Ukraine, but also another thing is, and this actually developed on what this man here said about, you know, uh, xenophobia in Russia. Alexei Navalny, Putin's supposed arch arch opponent, is an ethno-nationalist, and in my opinion, apart from that, being a sycophant to the West, that almost like the new Boris Yeltsin of the 2010s, he is basically everything, in my opinion, that a strong Russian leader is not. He has, he, to me, he has absolutely no profile that in any way resembles a strong Russian leader, and he will. I, I'm sure that he, if, again, only talking hypothet, only speaking hypothetically, if anyone even remotely like him is elected, it would be a dis- absolutely disastrous for uh, Russia and probably the stability of Eastern Europe and the Middle East and further afield. Thank absolutely. you. Very uh, uh, educated contribution. The gentleman next to you, please. Hello, um, my name is Fatai Taufik. I'm a student. I'm currently studying international relations. Um, well, my point is that we, as the Western world, we don't understand Russia at all. Russia, uh, Russia has been fr- Russia from the Romanovs to the communists till till Putin. Now we still don't understand Russia. I think the main the main uh, the main point is. The West wants to see Russia on his knees, and I totally agree with the gentleman in, um, right in front of me saying that um, the West doesn't understand Russia. Russia is a orthodox Christian country, and most Western countries now are like uh, are secularist. But the point is, I, myself, I was born under a dictatorship, and some of some of the older generations in which country in Nigeria. Okay. During 1996. So some of the older generation still wants to go to that military dictatorship whereby they knew that things were good then. But the younger generation wants to stay uh, under a democratic rule. But th- the main problem is, I, I personally believe that Russia did meddle in the US election because they want to get revenge on, on the US. And I believe that this coming election, the US will try to get meddle into the Russian election as, on, as another revenge. We all say that, oh, Russia is bad, Russia is bad, but US meddle in more election than, 
than uh, than Russia. Russia only meddled in one one election, and we all say this. We all, and we all talk about oh Russia is bad. Russia is bad. We never talk about Israel. Israel breaks more uh, more UN resolutions resolution than Russia. Russia has not. Russia name me name me one resolution Russia has broken. There's no UN resolution on, on Ukraine, so Russia didn't break any. But when Russia does one thing, we all start shouting, oh, Russia is this, Russia is this. But my, like I would say, Putin, I've, I'm 100% I'm sure Putin will win the next election and he'll probably stay until power till 2024, 20, until the next election. And I think he's not, he won't be able to run for the next, no. next election. But I've, I personally believe that he's doing well in the Middle East because obviously he's not turning Syria into another Libya because the the problem the West calls in Libya now, Libya is not even a country. Libya is like 16 countries. Libya is just full of factions and everything. So now the main, and we all talk about the new Cold War, new Cold War. I think the gentleman said that there's already a new Cold War. There's the next Cold War will not be between Russia and Russia and US because there's, there's, um, I'm from Beckham. So we always say there's a new kid in the block. And the new kid in the block now is China and India, because there would not be a new Cold War without China and India being involved. And I think China is more likely to side with the Russia, which will cause a big problem because economically that will be bad. And we all talk about well, Russia trying to um, attack US or attack Britain. Russia will never do that because Russia doesn't have the money. They might have the military equipment, but Russia and Putin are not dumb enough to attack us because they know that in their interests financially and economically it will be disastrous thank you the gentleman on the end there my name is george i'm from bulgaria we were under russian rule because that was decided just at the end of the second world war when stalin roosevelt and mr churchill decided how to divide europe so that was an experiment we will make one system socialist and the other system capitalist. 50 years contract. After 50 years, it all dissolved. Russia gave up all their republics because they wouldn't need them. And it remained just Russia as it is Russia. So about Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin is not an invention of uh, like uh, 18 years now. The whole system dissolved in 19. 80, when Brezhnev went in the ditch, and when uh, Andropov came, who was half dead, but he was a good KGB agent, and he knew what he was doing, then came Chernenko for about a couple of weeks, passed away, then who came? After Chernenko came uh, Gorbachev. Gorbachev, who is a, a Israeli guy, brought up um, by uh, the Israelis, so he uh, made the whole thing dissolve, and nobody... No, no, we can't have that. Uh, uh, first okay. of all, it's completely, it's completely <laughs> okay. untrue, uh, but it's also... Uh, it's it's true, it, but it's, it doesn't it's, matter. It's I know things, so... I no, can I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyone else yeah. who hasn't spoken? Yes, gentleman on the end there. Yes, it was, uh, it was very interesting to find out some new facts about Gorbachev being Israeli and uh, Bulgaria being under Russian rule. So, uh, yeah, my name, is, my name is Ernest. I'm doing uh, my master's in politics and security at the UCL. Originally, I'm from Russia, St. Petersburg, where I've lived here since I was uh, 13. So I'm Russian and British at the same time, so I tend to see things from two different sides. I think when it comes to, uh, obviously, Vladimir Putin as... Mr. Nekrasov and the lady over there just said it's, it's pretty obvious that in the first sort of eight years of his rule, he's done a lot. The GDP rose by 70%. I think the poverty, he got poverty by half. He went from 30% of the population to 15 and so on. So uh, there, is, there, are, there are lots of reasons why Russians support him, in fact, and it, it, the polls... The, what they show, his popularity, it's uh, not so hard to believe. I think when it comes to the elections, when it comes to Putin, we should look at these things not from a normative perspective, but we should look at it from the point of view of, we should look at it in terms of real politic, which is what the world is driven by. So I would say that we need to look at the reason why we are having these people on the streets uh, give the views that they, they give us it's uh, why does the Western media portray Russia in such a manner? You need to keep in mind that, first of all, uh, one of the main sort of reasons why certain wars happen in the world is the war for resources. 
Uh, obviously, Britain, we're running out of gas, and uh, the, the gas that we have in the North Sea is running out, and a few more years, more and more, we need to uh, start exporting gas from other countries, importing gas from other countries. Obviously, Norway doesn't have as much, so Russia is really the biggest sort of gas provider for Europe at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's imperative for Britain to have uh, somebody who is much more manageable than Vladimir Putin in power in Russia. Well, that's one that's way of looking at it. Would another way of looking at it not be that it's quite useful to have good relations with Russia, mm -hmm. given that we need its, uh, its uh, basic uh, raw materials and commodities to actually live ourselves. It's one of the many conundrums in the British, in particular, I'm talking about. The British hostility towards Russia is frankly foolish and self-defeating, no? Exactly. It is imperative to have these good relations with Russia. However, as long as you have Putin running Russia, uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian Federation will always be acting out of its national interest. Mm. Uh, hence, the, the cooperation... So we want a stooge on, government right, Yeah, the cooperation will be on, on Russia's terms as long as Putin is in power. So you need somebody who is more manageable, like Yeltsin, maybe like Gorbachev, as somebody made a reference to Navalny as being the new Yeltsin. I wouldn't really call him Yeltsin. He's more of a YouTuber. He was a YouTube personality. But uh, nevertheless, I think he initially, they wanted to give him a push but I believe that he went to some party at the New York Times magazine in 2012, made some anti-Semitic remarks, and uh, he, uh, they decided... He has a long history of anti-Semitic he, he does, he does, hence I wouldn't really call him a proponent. His so, uh, yeah. the, the, the liberal darlings in the media here, of course, uh, are happy to overlook that. Well, to be honest, uh, when, you do, when, when you do see uh, what is said about Navalny in the British media, in the American media, he is presented as the sort of a leader of the opposition, much like Berezovsky and Khodorkovsky were previously presented as such. However, when it comes to most Russians, if you go, in fact, to Russia and ask most people there, most of them, uh, even the anti-Putin Levada Center that recently carried out, they carry out polls on a regular basis, uh, even according to them, to their statistics, only some like one percent of Russians uh, support Navalny. So he, he uh, as a figure, just like Boris Nemtsov, just like uh, Berezovsky previously, he is non non-existent as an opposition figure. He does not present any threats. So uh, if he does get killed, it definitely wouldn't be Russians that kill him once again. So, yeah. Well, you have the look of a future president of Russia yourself, I must say. Yeah, so uh, too, much, too much responsibility. <laughs> Now, uh, let me uh, take a brief contribution from someone uh, who wants to make a two-minute contribution because then I've got to go to the break. Charles, would you respond to this, please? Um, in the past, as Alexander said, everything was predictable. Mutually assured destruction took care of that. A cold war can easily become a hot war. And... It strikes me that there are people in your country that don't mind starting one, maybe with Korea as the as the proximate cause. No, I don't see that as, as fully. I mean, it's always possible. Don't get me wrong. I don't. I personally don't see it. I think it's, uh, it was Alexander. I think you were saying mm. you don't see a, a, a hot war between the United States and Russia. I don't either. Uh, I think you, uh, you look at uh, President Trump. He's someone who understands the the. Uh, the need for threat, the threat of power is the best way to not have to use power. So you have to, you know, unlike Jeremy Corbyn, be very uh, self-assured in saying, yes, if North Korea attacks us or attacks an ally, we will hit the button. Um, otherwise, the system just doesn't work. Um, but I think it's a more disparate world now. Uh, China is an interesting player now. Uh, it needs to be watched. India, I'm not so worried about. Um, but, you know, just even, like I said, North Korea. North Korea, you just don't know what they're going to do. Uh, they're unpredictable. Uh, same uh, possibly with the Iranians. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it, it's a changed, unpredictable world, but not in the ways we maybe think. I think that the two stable ends will be uh, Russia and the United States. By, by the way, I, a lot of people think we, Americans hate Yeltsin uh, or Putin. I, I like the guy personally. I mean, I do like a strong leader. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's rather embarrassing as an American to watch uh, Putin and uh, President Obama. Uh, you know, that was a show of what strong leadership is. That's why I think Donald Trump likes the guy, as he says, because he's a strong leader. He can respect, he can respect the strength 
of, of, a, of, a, of a Putin, and hopefully the other way around. Uh, so, you know, we'll see where that relationship goes. Well, is peace breaking out here in the <laughs> studio? <laughs> no, Peter fun. Jukes disagrees, but after this... Charlie Mohara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television. Just as peace, consensus, amity was breaking out in the studio, forward came Peter Dukes. Go ahead, Peter. Yes, well, I love this programme, George, because I know you disagree with me, and I may have a minority opinion here, but we're allowed to disagree. Absolutely. Explore different That's why ideas. it's called Kali Mohara, free word. Exactly. I just alert your attention to what happens to investigative journalists That's in Russia. What happens to leaders of the opposition like Nemtsov? We can disagree, but there's a final point of where you cannot speak anymore, and that's in the silence of the grave. That is my fear. Of course, I understand in real politics, you need strong leaders. Russia feels it has its prestige back, though how much that is misinformation, how well off the average Russian is compared to the oligarch, that's a matter of debate. But it does worry me. here as well, of course. Of course. No, inequality is massive here. But this is the thing. America does bad things. It topples Mossadegh, it topples Allende, it intervenes in the election. Does that justify other countries doing it? We want a place, a, a world where exercise autonomy, where foreign inventions don't happen. And I don't see that we can just use the excuse of American bad behavior to, to uh, explain away Putin. Because what happens next if it's China next? What happens if it is another to an empire? Empire must be criticized. We fought against it in America. Why shouldn't you fight against a Russian empire? Quite so. Uh, I, I make this uh, point to you, though. Uh, I have not myself seen, and believe me, I've been looking, a scintilla of evidence, not a scintilla, that the Russians brought Donald Trump to power. I mean, a couple of Facebook ads, uh, some tweets. The United States is a gigantic and mature democracy. The idea that somebody in the Kremlin, by using... Twitter robots uh, persuaded uh, the people in Wisconsin and Michigan and the rest to vote for Donald Trump just seems to me entirely fanciful. Can I answer that? Yeah. Um, it's estimated uh, that there were about 3 billion Facebook impressions and tweets seen which were paid for, were one, uh, estimated $1.5 million a month by the Internet Research Agency. Now, I don't think... Russia has created racism or Black Lives Matter or, or in, in America, but it's very clever exploiting it. We know they organize about 60 events Does in America Florida. need help to have racism? All it, no, I agree. Am but all America it was, was no, exactly. built on racism. Exactly, what I'm saying. But there were 30,000 votes that flipped that election in regional areas, of which we know there were attempts, I don't say they changed the electoral register, but maybe people to deregister. There was certainly an attempt to widen America's divides. Joel Stein, Bernie Sanders was supported, mm -hmm. anybody but clearly. Who can, but that is the first time, I think, we caught in social media an election being clearly gained. Now, obviously it's happened in the past. But you cannot, if you cannot be secure about your elections, you don't know your voter rolls are, you know, are, are safe and secure. You don't know if this person, GOP Tennessee, was actually not an American with 100,000 followers. It was a paid-for troll in the Olguino suburb, suburb of St. Petersburg. We have to keep whoever's attacking them, our democracy, safe from influence. Powerful point, uh, Peter. Uh, the, the, uh, no, no, I indicated this gentleman here on the end first, please. Thank you very much. My name is Goran. I'm a student in international relations at UCL here. Uh, actually, from a utopianistic, idealistic point of view, I also agree that nobody should kill anyone. Of course, that's a bad thing. Nobody, you don't need anyone to tell you that that's a good thing. But uh, I would like to look at the U.S. foreign policy and their 20 years as a hegemon, what they have actually done uh, to the world in contrast to Russia, which is proving more useful, I believe, from my objective point of view, in Syria. Uh, the U.S. itself has produced uh, the Syrian refugee crisis by toppling uh, down democratic regimes in uh, Libya, Gaddafi, that was Hillary, uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, that was George Bush, both senior, junior, Bill Clinton, and uh, 
even though they promote themselves as the champions of liberalism and democracy, uh, I have yet to see them successfully building peace in the world. Uh, I also agree, yes, we should deter Russian imperialism if there is any, because nobody should be the sole hegemon in um, world politics nowadays. So, definitely. I'm Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this young gentleman there. Thank you. Um, my name is Tariq Karim. I'm a filmmaker, writer and uh, producer. Um, my question slightly differs. I agree with a lot of things that have been said today. I also disagree with a lot of things, especially in terms of where the Russia whole new McCarthy uh, agenda came from. And it seems to have come from the Democratic Party. It's come from the liberals who used to be the victims. Exactly. And so they're of, using uh, that McCarthyism. a little bit on why they didn't beat Donald Trump, who to many people should have really not uh, won the presidency. Uh, my question, though, is more towards the media. I feel like a lot of the things that we struggle with are to do with the media. So whichever gains that we seem to make, whether you're a left Corbyn supporter, as I am, or whether you're just somebody who looks at geopolitics and is unhappy with regime change, whether it's uh, in Iraq, or cheap regime change, or regime change on the, chain, uh, on the cheap, excuse me, in Syria, where you just send a whole bunch of terrorists and call them moderate rebels. Um, so my question to you, George, if I may, is, is there a strategy? Can we strategize a way to sort of fight back against the media, which always seems to push in the wrong direction for what most decent people want, want to achieve? Well, their days are numbered. Uh, the days of uh, media hegemons, uh, multi-billionaire owners, uh, are, are numbered and, uh, and numbered shortly. Uh, the proliferation of alternative media, the ability to get information and communicate it with others uh, has never been faster and greater. Uh, the day will come in your lifetime, sadly not mine, uh, when there will be nothing called newspapers. Uh, a newspaper will be something you see in a museum in a, in a glass case. <laughs> and I'm personally quite happy uh, about that when the last editor is strangled with the last copy of a <laughs> newspaper, I'll be a happy man. Uh, ignorance is a choice for most people in the world, in the developed, wealthy parts of the world. Ignorance is a choice. If you wanted to know the truth, you could find it. Uh, you don't have to listen to these uh, front pages I referred to earlier this morning, uh, literally accusing the leader of the Labour Party of being a paid KGB agent. Now, there may be enough people ready to uh, listen to that sort of thing today. I think tomorrow uh, there will not be. Much will depend on how Corbyn comes out uh, fighting. Dr. Tom. I mean, I would agree with you, George. Perhaps we should re um, rename the mainstream media the legacy media because it's um, coming towards the end of its days. Mm -hmm. I think just to pick up on a few points that Peter made earlier um, about the snipers in Ukraine, the, it's actually been shown since then that it wasn't the Bierkult, it wasn't Yanukovych. It was actually um, mercenaries. A couple of Georgians have confessed and they've since disappeared. Um, I mean, the, the West... There's a telephone call uh, establishing that, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there's also the, um, the Latin, I think it was Lat you know, Lithuanian, one Lithuanian MP the days after the, few days after the snipers shot 70 mm -hmm. people, um, was overheard speaking to, I think it was an American, um, someone that might have even been Veronica Newland saying that actually. It was. Yeah, we know it was. Veronica Newland, yeah. Yeah. So I think in terms of um, people like Alexander, now it's in, Navalny, that's it. No, no sorry, Nemtsov, Nemtsov, who was assassinated. Um, he was basically nobody. He'd been a politician in the 90s. He'd fallen out of favor. Very few, very few people knew him. His assassination was what actually brought, brought him back into prominence. Mm. Um, he was certainly not a threat to anyone. Um, well, Navalny, isn't that the point, uh, Peter, that a lot of people get killed in Russia, though not quite as many as get killed in America, uh, especially if you're a child going to school. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the, the truth is, the truth is that the, uh, the people that are said to have been killed by Putin were no conceivable threat to Putin. So even if he was a monster, why would he kill them? It's, uh, it's a bit like Assad. Every time there's an international conference on Syria, he apparently uh, uh, fires uh, uh, chemical weapons just to give them something to talk about. There comes a point, doesn't there, Tom, where all this becomes 
a bit childish. I think so in Syria, every time the Syrian Arab army advanced, every time they, uh, they, they, they kick our military out of a major city, um, then we have um, reports of chemical weapons attacks coming. It's funny, you can actually chart the chemical weapons attacks or the allegations come just after the Syrian army advances and mm. against Al-Qaeda. Um, it'll be really interesting, though, um, I do wonder, is um, if Putin really is knocking off his political opponents, why are the major politicians in Russia, who are actually opponents of Putin, why are they still here? Like um, uh, Shuganov, um, Grudinin, um, uh, Zhirinovsky, people who are likely to care about... I mean, Zhugan, uh, Grudinin, who's the, um, the current uh, leader of the Communist Party, is probably going to get about 10 15% of the vote. If, if there's a runoff, it'll be down to Putin and Grudinin. And actually, Grudinin has some very good policies. And I, you know, I, I think I would agree with you, George. I, I would vote for Grudinin. Um, he certainly, I think he's going to send a strong message to Putin to say that he needs to put the oligarchs in check. I mean, Putin's done a lot. But the fact is, the oligarchs still hold a lot of sway in Russia. And I do think that a, good, a decent vote for Grudinin will help send Putin a message that, you know, you're doing well, but you need to do more. You need to actually tackle domestic problems. You need to actually... Reduce inequalities. Doctor uh, Marcos, uh, Marcos, where 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 is uh, all this uh, going to end? Uh, are these the death throes of American hegemony that we're watching, uh, and thus violent in their uh, intent, uh, or uh, will this somehow reach a peaceable settlement? I make this point, I was going to make it to Charlie either, uh, earlier. If Trump is overthrown, he doesn't like the word overthrown, but that's what it means. If Trump is overthrown and a Democrat comes to power in the United States, the current posture of the Democratic Party is unbelievably warlike and hostile to Russia. It's not that Trump will cause a war with Russia, the Democrats might cause a war with Russia. How's this going to end? I do not believe that there will be a war between Russia and America. Ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis, there are mechanisms in place whereby uh, whoever's in the White House, whoever's in the Kremlin, they speak with each other. In regard to American global power, it's not in decline, I regret to say. It's weakened. It's not like the American power of the 1990s or of the early 2000s. Um, but America will remain a superpower. I don't believe China and India will become a superpower in the sense of America. I think that under Vladimir Putin's tenure, um, the world uh, will return to the days of a bipolar world when there were two uh, superpowers. And picking up on your point, Peter, um, I would cite the principle of action-reaction. Russia is responding to NATO, an antagonistic organization which it demonstrated above the skies of Serbia. Russia is, is responding to NATO on its doorstep. It's responding to an American missile defense um, system which is aimed at the Russian nuclear deterrent. And Russia is responding to America bringing about revolutions in former Soviet republics to draw them into NATO. How would the Americans react if, say, Mexico was a member of a Russian-led military alliance? The Americans wouldn't, wouldn't tolerate that. Very, very quickly, George, um, Vladimir Putin is the heart and soul of Russian resurgence, and that, in the eyes of the Americans and the British, is his biggest sin. But I actually think the world should applaud Vladimir Putin, it's actually going to become a safer world. Let's just look at Syria. If it wasn't for Vladimir Putin, the flags of ISIS... And yes, they would be, would be flying, flying at Damascus, Damascus. Now, yes. That's the truth of the matter. Last word to the Arabs. Go ahead, sir. I think what is needed is more Russian intervention, decisive <laughs> Russian intervention in countries like Yemen. I mean, if it wasn't, I mean. If it wasn't for Russian abstaining abstaining from actually vetoing the decision by Saudi Arabia, encouraged by the Americans to meddle and to launch an aggressive, merciless, cruel war against the Yemeni people, we wouldn't have seen this war drag on what the United Nations calls, uh, calls a man-made, I do call it a Saudi-made, backed by the USA, humanitarian, biggest humanitarian crisis in Yemen. We've seen what happened in Libya when actually Russia also abstained in the United Nations. Now, we do need, need to see more vetoes in terms of preventing U.S. aggression under the pretext of preventing further Iranian meddling. Well, I don't know if it was enough, but it's all there is. It's been marvelous. I hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs>